John Adams once said, Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. And the sad fact is that the church in Acts did not just have challenges to face outside from the Romans, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. They also had serious problems to deal with inside too. Luke writes, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Obviously, there were two distinct groups here named in the passage, the Hebrews and the Hellenists, but clearly both groups were equally part of the body of Christ in every way. And today, we really need to look deeper into who these two groups were, and most importantly, what their existence should teach us as followers of the Messiah, who rely on every word of Scripture to guide us in all of our thinking. Easton's Bible Dictionary explains, For a long period, a feeling of mutual jealousy had existed between the Hebrews, or Jews proper, who spoke the sacred language of Palestine, and the Hellenists, or Jews of the Grecian speech, who had adopted the Grecian language and read the Septuagint version of the Bible instead of the Hebrew. So, the main distinguishing difference between the Hebrews and the Hellenists was one of language. And this is confirmed by every reliable scholarly source you can find. For example, Strong's Concordance defines a Hellenist as a Greek-speaking Jew, that is, one who can speak Greek only and not Hebrew or Aramaic. Smith's Bible Dictionary explains that a Hellenist was the term applied in the New Testament to Greek-speaking or Grecian Jews. And Webster's Revised Unabridged Dictionary explains that the Hellenist was especially a person of Jewish extraction who used the Greek language as his mother tongue, as did the Jews of Asia Minor, Greece, Syria, and Egypt. So, language, not devotion, understanding, or obedience, created the first improper form of division in the Acts Church. And the Greek-speaking Jews celebrated the same feasts of the Lord, and they earnestly worshipped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they didn't speak or read the Hebrew language. And, just as our Greek-based New Testament does, a Hellenist would have called Shavuot Pentecost, which means the 50th in Greek. Plus, a Hellenist would call Yeshua Aesus, as all of the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament record too. They would have known Jesus as the Alpha and Omega from the Greek alphabet, and they would have recognized the word hypocrite that Jesus so often used as a uniquely Greek word. And it was these Greek-speaking Jews who felt like their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of charitable assistance that came from the donations of others in the church. They felt like they were being looked down on and neglected because of a simple thing like their language. And based on the reaction of the apostles, they must have been correct. It seems that much like Dr. Snooze's star-bellied sneetches, the Hebrews who spoke primarily in Hebrew or Aramaic, may have been looking down on the Hellenists and making them feel like they were less of a disciple of the Messiah simply because they didn't speak or read in the Hebrew language. But nowhere in the scriptures is there any justification for treating anyone differently for their language. The only passage that might be misinterpreted to do so is found in Nehemiah, but in context, it actually says, In those days I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. 
and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. So I contended with them and cursed them, struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. And he went on to say, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like Solomon, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even Solomon to sin. Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleanse them of everything pagan. I also assign duties to the priests and the Levites, each according to his service. You see, Nehemiah was angry because they married pagan women who were leading them into pagan forms of idolatry just as Solomon's wives misled him. But he wasn't angry with them just for forgetting the language of Judah. While it is true that the prophet Zephaniah recorded that one day God will restore to the peoples a pure language that they may all call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. It is clear in that passage that this occurs after God fulfills his promise to pour on them his indignation, all of his fierce anger, and all of the earth shall be devoured with the fire of God's jealousy. And frankly, while we like to believe that the Lord will restore all people to the Hebrew language, the passage doesn't actually mention which particular language will be restored. Ultimately, the prophet Daniel explains about the Messiah. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So God desires every people, nation, and language to serve his glorious son, and we should never, ever make spiritual divisions in God's church based on fleshly things like language or other non-biblical issues. And to this point, the apostles did not treat the Hellenists as less than the Hebrews when they solved the problem of unequal distribution. In fact, based on the names of the men who were chosen, they seemed to have appointed Hellenists to positions of leadership in the church when they created the office of deacon. The name Stephen in the Greek is Stephanos, and his name means crowned. The name Philip is Greek, pronounced Philippos, and his name means lover of horses. The name Prochorus in the Greek is Prochoros, and his name means leader of the chorus. The name Nicanor is the same in the Greek, and his name means conqueror. The name Timon is the same in the Greek, and his name means honorable. The name Parmenas is the same in the Greek, and his name means abiding. And the name Nicholas is the same in the Greek language, and his name means conqueror of the people. All of these names are distinctly Hellenistic or Greek, and Nicholas wasn't even a natural-born Jew. He was a convert to Judaism, called a proselyte. And the stubborn fact of the matter is, the Bible has been handed down to us through the ages in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And Acts chapter 6, among hundreds of other passages, proves that there's not just one single correct language for a disciple of Jesus to speak to be a devout follower of the Messiah. But as always, we will use scripture and reliable scholarly evidence to prove these points. And we won't rely on unsubstantiated statements or apocryphal books to attempt to convince anyone of our position. We are here to seek the truth because the truth can set us free from pride 
error, deception, and every other sin. And God has given us the truth in His glorious Word. So let's begin by noticing that the New Testament records that Jesus Himself was clearly multilingual. And we'll start in Mark's Gospel. Mark recorded, Then Jesus took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. In this passage, Mark recorded Jesus speaking Aramaic words, and he spelled them out with Greek letters. This, of course, doesn't mean that Jesus only spoke Aramaic, but it means at least he spoke some Aramaic. And about Jesus speaking in the Aramaic language, Dr. Mark D. Roberts of Fuller Seminary wrote, It makes sense that residents of Nazareth spoke Aramaic, given the fact that Aramaic became the official language of Galilee from the 6th century B.C. onward. But Mark also records Jesus speaking in Hebrew when he records the nickname Jesus gave to James the son of Zebedee and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. So now we know that Jesus knew Aramaic because he grew up in Nazareth in Galilee, where it was the official language. But he also knew Hebrew, most likely because Hebrew was sometimes used in the synagogues as a special liturgical language, much like how some churches today use Latin. And Mark shows Jesus speaking Aramaic at another point when he stated, Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva, and looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said, Ephata, that is, be opened. But Mark is not the only gospel writer who records Jesus speaking multiple times in Aramaic because John wrote, And he brought Peter to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. And Jesus wasn't alone in the use of Aramaic, even in Jerusalem, because Luke recorded about Judas and the field that he died in, it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called, in their own language, Akel Dama, that is, the field of blood. This is another Aramaic phrase, and Luke calls it their own language, in reference to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was a multilingual city, and that explains why, when Jesus was crucified, an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the King of the Jews. And getting back to the languages of Jesus, Paul said, At midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And Jesus would have seemingly had to speak Greek along with Hebrew, based on Mark's account where he writes, A woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about Jesus, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then Jesus said to her, For this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. Now, 
Either this Greek woman was multilingual or Jesus spoke Greek. But someone had to speak another language for this conversation to take place. And a clue about which one spoke the other's language can be found in Matthew. Matthew records the Lord speaking an Aramaic phrase in the same passage that he calls Peter by the Greek equivalent of his name. And Jesus actually makes a Greek word pun at the same time. This is found where Matthew recorded Jesus saying, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Peter's name in the Greek is Petros. And Jesus said, You are Petros, and on this Petra I will build my church. This particular play on words seems to only work in the language of Greek, just as we have received it. Plus, Matthew preserved the Aramaic in this same passage, showing that it couldn't have all been translated from another language. And Matthew also records Jesus using a specific Greek letter when he said, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Friends, Jesus did not say one jot or one tittle in the original Greek manuscripts. Translators decided to interpret his words instead of translate them here. Jesus actually said, one iota, or one point. And the iota is the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet, very similar to our letter I. Now it's remotely possible that Jesus may have said jot and tittle that day, but the fact is that Matthew recorded him saying something very differently in a different language in the Holy Scriptures. The fact is that the law, the prophets, and the writings were translated from Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek hundreds of years before Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. And many of the Messiah's contemporaries were using that Greek translation called the Septuagint at that time in history. So it's very, very likely that the Messiah actually said not one iota would pass from the law because most of his hearers would have been reading Moses in the Greek language. In Biblical Archaeological Review, Peter W. Vanderhorst writes, One of the most surprising facts about funerary inscriptions extant from ancient Palestine, dating from 300 B.C. to 500 A.D., is that most of them are in Greek, approximately 70%. About 12% are in Latin, and only 18% are in Hebrew or Aramaic. This is referring to the inscriptions family members would make on things like the ossuaries or bone boxes of their deceased relatives. Loved ones would lay out their precious family member who passed away in a tomb, and after they decayed completely, they would then carefully placed their bones in a small box called an ossuary where they would remain. But 70% of the people living in ancient Israel in the times of the Messiah labeled their loved one's remains in Greek. So while we know that Jesus spoke Hebrew along with Aramaic and Greek and possibly even Latin, we also know that the Greek language was very popular in his time. And the Greek Septuagint was also extremely popular in the first century as the Holy Scriptures that most people were reading. And the New Testament and even Jesus himself quotes the readings we have preserved in the Greek Septuagint instead of the readings we have preserved in the Hebrew Masoretic text which is typically the basis for most modern Bibles. This is why Dr. John S. Barnett writes 
that Jesus used the Greek Septuagint translation 90% of the time. About the Septuagint, the New World Encyclopedia remarks, of significance for all Christians and for all Bible scholars, the LXX, or Septuagint, is quoted by the Christian New Testament and by the Apostolic Fathers, and the Septuagint was held with great respect at ancient times. Philo and Josephus ascribed divine inspiration to its authors. The encyclopedia goes on to note the discovery of many fragments in the Dead Sea Scrolls that agree with the Septuagint rather than the Masoretic text proved that many of the variants in the Greek were also represented in early Semitic manuscripts. And the Septuagint enjoyed widespread use in the Hellenistic Jewish diaspora and even in Jerusalem, which had become a rather cosmopolitan and therefore Greek-speaking town. Both Philo and Josephus show a reliance on the Septuagint in their citations of Jewish scripture. You see, when we look at the ancient Greek translation of the Bible and compare it to the ancient Dead Sea Scrolls, they match up far more often than the Hebrew Masoretic text matches. And when we compare the quotations of the New Testament writers to the Greek Septuagint, they match far more often than the Hebrew Masoretic text also. This evidence along with the high regard ancient scholars had for the Septuagint, reveals that the ancient Greek Old Testament was very popular in the time of Jesus. According to the book, Old Testament Quotations in the New Testament, Harvard PhD Gleason Archer and his co-writer G.C. Chirichingo conclude there are 340 places where the New Testament cites the Septuagint, but only 33 places where it cites from the Hebrew Masoretic text. So based on all available evidence, this means that the Hellenistic segment of the church that used the Septuagint as their scriptures, not the Hebrew segment, are more clearly represented in the New Testament that we have received. And this is why the New Testament was recorded in the language of Koine or Common Greek. Because Greece had conquered the known world before the Romans and under Alexander the Great, Greek had become a nearly universal language. So, while Jesus, Paul, John, and the other apostles certainly knew Hebrew, they also communicated in Greek and ultimately, they even wrote the scriptures in Greek as well to reach the world with the gospel. Friends, the portions of the Holy Scriptures that we know as the New Testament are actually Hellenistic documents based on the most reliable definition of the word Hellenist. The earliest manuscripts from the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd century are all written in Koine Greek. And the Old Testament quotations and allusions contained in the New Testament are nearly all quoting the ancient Greek Old Testament version known as the Septuagint. But as always, I won't just make a claim without proving it directly from Scripture. Instead now, I'll share with you a few more examples of quotes from the New Testament that come directly from the Septuagint Greek version of the law the prophets in the writings. In Acts 7.14, when Stephen said that 75 people came with Jacob to Egypt, he wasn't quoting the Hebrew Masoretic text that said that only 70 were with Jacob. Friends, he was quoting the Greek Septuagint text of Genesis 46.27 that recorded 75 people went down. And you won't find the phrase, in vain they worship me, that Jesus attributed to Isaiah in the Hebrew Masoretic text. But you will find that phrase, just as the Messiah quoted it in the Greek Septuagint when you read. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain 
They worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And there's the example of Hebrews 10.5 compared to Psalm 46, where the New Testament says, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. But the Hebrew Masoretic text records, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, my ears you have opened, burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. The fact is that if we didn't have the ancient Greek Septuagint we would be forced to conclude that over 300 times the New Testament writers misquoted the existing Hebrew and Aramaic scriptures. But praise the Lord, we do still have the ancient Greek translation of the Bible that the New Testament writers were obviously relying on. And in that Greek translation, Psalm 46 actually says, Sacrifice and offering." You did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me, exactly as the book of Hebrews quotes it. As I mentioned before, there are 340 examples, just like the ones we just saw, that demonstrate that the New Testament writers used and quoted and relied on the Greek Septuagint, while there's only 33 examples where they slightly departed from that ancient popular Greek translation that was preferred by the Hellenists of Acts chapter 6. So to summarize what we have seen so far today, we have learned that there were two distinct groups in the early New Testament church, the Hebrews, who were the Jews who spoke, wrote, and read in Hebrew, and sometimes in Aramaic, and the Hellenists, who were Jews that spoke, wrote, and read primarily in Greek. The apostles of our Lord did not look down on or treat the Greek-speaking Jews any differently than the Hebrew-speaking Jews. And based on their Greek names, the apostles chose Greek-speaking Jews as the first deacons in the church. We also learned that Jesus referred specifically to the Greek letter Iota in the Sermon on the Mount. And he most likely spoke Greek to the Greek woman who had a daughter with an unclean spirit, as well as to the Greeks who came to see him in the Gospel of John. Plus, we can add to those facts John's written record of the Messiah's words in Revelation, where twice he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, which are the beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet. And all of this is in addition to the fact that the New Testament uses the Hellenized name for the Feast of Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks when labeling it Pentecost or 50th in the Greek language. Yet, in dozens of other places, certain Hebrew words are transliterated into Greek in the New Testament, such as Armageddon, Abaddon, and so on. We also know that the earliest 1st, 2nd, and 3rd century manuscript witnesses of the New Testament are all recorded in Greek. And we don't have any translations from those earliest Greek manuscripts into any other languages until the 2nd or 3rd century. We also learned that the Septuagint, or LXX as it's also called, was the revered Bible of the Hellenists in Acts chapter 6, and it is the oldest Greek translation of the Old Testament because its translation began around 247 BC by 70 scholars in Alexandria, Egypt for a rapidly expanding community of Greek-speaking Jews, and it was completed no later than 117 BC. And about the Septuagint, R.K. Harrison notes, the Septuagint, was also most likely the standard Old Testament text used by the early Christian church. Early Septuagint material is included in the Rylands Papyrus, 458, which dates back to 150 B.C. So, the point of all of this is, even in Acts chapter 6, the church was multilingual, and 
Many people in the church spoke Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, and possibly even Latin. But no one particular language was considered more holy or more religious than any other language by the apostles or even by Jesus our Lord. The scriptures quoted in the Greek New Testament most often were directly quoted from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And Greek was the most common language available for Jews and Gentiles alike to receive and understand the glorious gospel of the Messiah. And while we may each prefer one language over another, we must never miss the biblical fact that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Truly, though we have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though we have all faith so that we could remove mountains, but have not love, we are nothing. And the Apostle Paul has written, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is rich to all who call upon him. And as the apostles in Acts chapter 6 did, we must endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace while we remember that we have put off the old man of the flesh with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and in all. These divinely revealed truths made the Hebrews and the Hellenists one in their Messiah in Acts chapter 6, and we must remember to continually apply these precious truths to our thinking as a church as well, as we follow our exalted King in the light of His glorious Word.